today I'm going to talk about like director. I had two lists. I did my favorite directors list. And I did a list which was um, about other directors. I didn't make the list. Didn't make the top list, but I still really like. Instead of going further down that direction, which wouldn't be interesting, especially now go towards directors of different types of things. So I'm not. This is going to be my last one before Christmas of directors. I mean, I may do other things around directors after Christmas period, but this is like for directors who I consider they go towards the cheesier genres. The the genres are B movie directors. They're still wonderful. I still love watching all the films. Uh, so in some ways, this could almost be a trilogy of like. Part one was the best directors, part two was the interesting one, part three is like the uh is a cheese fest third movie in a series. <laughs> That's the way I like to look at this one. And then any other list I'll do of other directors like like Asian film directors and all that will be like part of the list but not part of it. So I hope that makes sense. But this is a cheesy part three. You know, the the, the Jaws 3D of the series, the Alien 3, the Godfather 3 of the series. <laughs> You know, the thing you don't watch very often, <laughs> right? So okay, I've got a list, and I'm going to start with a director who's taken very seriously, but I consider to be a German director, because <laughs> I don't think his films are very deep, but that is fun, which is Miles Scorsese. Ooh, he's mocking Scorsese. Yep. I didn't... He makes good movies, I don't think he's... Half the director of films, someone like Paul Schrader, who can deliver the, the themes. I think a lot of films he makes by himself aren't thematically that interesting, but they're the great visuals and they're fun actors. And see, that's why I, I think of his B movies as like they're they're fun. They might not have the greatest depth. No, well, sometimes they do, but they're fun. They're enjoyable. It's because he's a B movie genre director. <laughs> you know. I say that with love, but yeah, I mean, a lot of his films, uh, I mean, the last 15 years, he's done a lot of genre films like The Parted, that Shutter Island, which I couldn't sit through, you know. The Wolf of Wall Street is a genre movie of, like, basically crooks in the financial district, basically. That's what it is. It could have been made in the 40s for, you know, black and white, in 80 minutes long, you know, starring a couple of new people you would would be in three movies and they disappear forever or Kirk Douglas or something it could have been one of those kind of movies made you know made in the 40s instead it's a three hour epic maybe DiCaprio but it's still that kind of movie you know and a lot of his movies of that kind of feel to them they're like I'm supposed to do it as seriously as a movie I don't quite do that <laughs> I mean some of his best ones I think are have good good ideas like Last Temptation of Christ or Taxi Driver or Raging Bull but even then a Raging Bull I think is a good film but I think it's thematically not as strong as people seem to think it is I think it's there's a lot of like going over the same you know genre path again and again and again like the, like the biography genre it, it doesn't feel like it's subverted as much as a lot of critics at the time suggested it was. It was just, it just wasn't as um, sentimental as before. It was like, it's his own fault really, but it still feels like a biography, <laughs> you know. You know, I just I just can't get behind Scorsese as a top level series director. I just always think he's a genre director, you know, who the critics seem to love a bit too much. Oh, I'm sure that's what popular. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I just thought it's better to be up front and see what you think. I'm not even, it's not even belittling. I love genre directors. Like, when I think of Scorsese as a genre director, I really like him. When I think of him as a serious A-list or tour, I don't like him as much. <laughs> so that's kind of the weird thing I've got with Scorsese. So, uh, he's the first on my list. Right, the next is John Milius. John Milius is a uh, director I like a lot more than Scorsese. Because he's, you know, he's up front about the fact he's a bit crazy. You know, and he makes 
great fun movies about crazy people. It makes movies about war, but it doesn't really, even though his reputation is as a, like a warmonger, we look at to look at his movies, a lot of them they actually show that the war's not great. The war is cruel. Like something like Red Dawn, which is a, is a really fun movie. Red Dawn's really fun because uh, it starts with the idea of the the, the, the right wing America's biggest nightmare is like the communists attacking him. And it happens in this movie. And then it shows that they. They. They make, thing, they make fantasy of. All the kids will get together and they'll fight back and they'll, even though they're under pressure. That happens too. But it shows it's not really that much fun. It's pretty grungy, it's pretty horrible, and most of the kids die, and it's a nasty situation, it's for naught. So that's what Melis is good at. It's like, yeah, he'll take something that's a big popless idea. And he's an individualist, so yeah, he's more to the right than the kind of left, but he likes people. He's not a cruel director to people who he disagrees with, you know. It makes very it makes films that do have a sense of humanity to them. So at the end of Red Dog, for instance, you really feel for the kids and you really feel bad for how horrible the situation's got. You know, Big Wayne's which I've talked about before, was a great movie about aging, about um the idea of these sufferers who were the kings when they were like seventeen and then they have to move on with their lives when they're no longer viewed over as the kings are now a next generation compared to the next generation and they're just the old guys. And it's how do you deal with that? Uh, you know, Dillinger is about a guy who's a bank robber and who's basically he's mythologized himself uh, and created a legend of Dillinger, but he's basically out of date, there's no way he's going to survive. And it's all about that idea of the myth versus the man himself. Uh, one of the Millicent's most underrated films is Farewell to the King, which is very messy. It's about a guy, Nick Nolte, who goes to, um, who's a deserter in World War II. You know, that's not a usual character for a right-wing director, a deserter. Uh, he ends up in the jungle and suddenly becomes uh, a god to these natives. And then he has to bring them together once the Japanese attack the island he's on. And... Um, it's all bad. I mean, he's crazy, but he learns to to be something more than this coward. He learns to be something that's very unique and intriguing to everybody. He's a guy everyone talks about as something unusual. But at the same time, he's still this deserter from the American Army. And it's a wonderful film, and it's mad, and it's crazy, and it's been cut to hell by the distributors. Like, they lost like half an hour, 40 minutes out of it, and you can feel it in the film because it's paced very oddly. But it's still a beautiful film. It's still got some great moments in it. And that's what I like about Milius. There's other films he made, like uh, Conan, which is great fun, The Wind in the Line, which is a wonderful movie about Roosevelt and um, an Arab played by Sean Connery. Milius, in the 70s and 80s, Milius made a lot of interesting movies. He made, he also wrote like, Apocalypse Now, he wrote Dirty Harry, he wrote, you know, he, he's like, he wrote a big, one of the big scenes in Jaws, the, the Indianapolis scene. He was a really important director in the 70s and 80s. Even in the 90s, he was less, in, his career kind of collapsed as a director, but he still made Rough Riders, which is this movie for Turner Classics, all about the American invasion of Cuba in the late uh, 1890s. It was wonderful. It was, it was a TV movie. You can say it was a TV movie, but it was made of a lot of passion. So Melius is fascinating. I really like Melius. I'll hopefully do some more stuff in him because he's a really interesting director. Again, he's one of those directors like people don't think of as a classic great director, but he's really interesting. He really deserves a lot more, you know, respect. Okay. Um, next is John Landis. John Landis is another one from the seventies. Another movie brought from the seventies, uh, whose career went wayward in the nineties and. That was it. I mean, basically, he was big for a time and then he wasn't. And some of the like, 90s movies are painful. I mean, um, Blues Bros 2000 is some great music, but the film comedy stuff itself is terrible. Bear with the Hills Cop 3 is like, why the hell was he thinking? You know, he kind of got in a rut where he had to make some movies he didn't really want to make. And he wasn't 
making the stuff you wanted to make at a certain point. And but the 70s and 80s stuff were all great fun. I mean they did Kentucky Fried movie which is hilarious. Animal House, Trading Places, The Blues Brothers, you know. Then there was this little silly mid 80s movies like Spies Like Us and Three Amigos and then he came back with Coming to America. And there's American Way from London which is a really good horror comedy. I mean there's a lot of really good films in there. Um, there's a real um, a kind of a funny subversive voice to him like he he doesn't like the rich you know he, uh, he's mocking of a lot of like institutions he he portrays a lot of uh, serious people as stupid you know it's I mean um, there's a lot of fun elements to John Landis that um, he's a big broad director you know he he doesn't go in for subtlety he's in for like the broad paintbrush it's like very cartoonish but within that he, he does a lot of good stuff and he, he's really uh, worth watching I mean the, the Blues Brothers is a wonderful musical with lots of car chases you know and some lots of funny moments in it Animal House is hilarious you know um, nowadays there's some jokes that are pretty dubious but by the time they weren't and it's still got a good um, good natured feel to it despite some of the raunchy of jokes and a lot of the movies he does has that good nature to feel to it. I mean, uh, he he had problems because of Twilight Zone situation where he, when he was directing a movie, a helicopter crashed and killed people. That became a problem for him, obviously. But the movies kept on coming. I mean, I remember I watched a lot of his movies in the eighties, like um, like Spies Like Cars. I've seen way too many times. You know, I saw the cinema and I've seen it quite a lot since then. I mean, Three Amigos is hilarious. Three Amigos is really weird. It was a massive bomb when it was released, but it's a really bizarre, funny movie with Steve Martin and Chevy Chase and Martin Short. It's just weird. But it's wonderful. If you're into the spirit of it, it's one of those movies in the 80s, like Little Shop of Horrors, where it's like, who are the audience for this film? You know, I don't understand who the audience was, but it's great they made it because it's a wonderful film. Landis kind of did things like that as well there was a kind of he was that weird 80s director that was kind of commercial you know but critics didn't like him because he was abroad he wasn't he didn't do what they thought was sophisticated but there was, a, there was a really good nature to his films and there was a really good energy to them that once he his career started to go became lacking in mainstream cinema that mainstream cinema needs people like Landis who are a bit weird you know it gave a it's a good energy to have, really. So uh, that's John Landis. And the next one is someone simple as Joe Dante. Joe Dante uh, was another director who was who did, he was really big in the 80s. 70s he was building up. Then in the 90s he started to fall away. But he's made films every so often. They come out and they're still good films. I mean, he's he's kept working. It's just very slowly. I mean, he's he's done some TV as well. But he's always... Again, he's a very good natured films. Um, he's most famous for the Gremlin films. Gremlins 1 and 2. Uh, I love Gremlins 2. Gremlin 2 is hilarious. Gremlin 2 takes the piss out of sequels. It's like it mocks its own original movie. It asks all the questions everyone asks at the movie in the first, fully, first place and mocks the answers. It has this weird structure where, it, where it's just falls apart as a narrative. It does, it does all these gags. And just does not take its own threat seriously. And his musical numbers with the Gremlins, has like TV parodies. At one point, the Gremlins actually uh, attacked Leonard Maltin, who basically gives the first film a bad review. So the second one, he's given a review of Gremlins, and uh, the Gremlins attack him. You know, stuff like that. It's just, I mean, it was good that he was a like, good teacher enough to do that. <laughs> like both the director and Maltin that had the sense of humour to say that was funny. <laughs> You know, that's Joe Dante. He kind of does these weird jokes that aren't quite as aren't quite mainstream. I mean, he did the Howling, which was a funny parody of like self help from the seventies. Which, but it was a werewolf movie. Like these werewolves trying to get better, <laughs> and it was that was really funny. Um, In our space was a guy who, um, a, a, a guy who's injected into Martin Short, who's a hypochondriac, and Martin Short's like Jerry Lewis and it's, it's quite a funny movie um, 
But the, the, the Jaunty films I really like are stuff like The Burbs or Matinee or Explorers. Or even Gremlins 2 is another one where it's really weird. I mean, The Burbs is about Tom Hanks who starts to get paranoid about his neighbours. It's a very simple situation where he's cocking. But they, they really just go with the weirdness of this guy who starts off very sane and slowly crazier and crazier and crazier. It's wonderful. Um, I've seen that film way too many times. Me and a friend of mine, Darren, we used to we could quote it to each other because we watched it so many times as students. Um, Matinee I saw twice in one weekend when it first came out because I loved it so much. It was uh, these kids uh, during the Missile Crisis in uh, Florida Keys and them going to watch movies, these horror movies, to try and get their minds off what's going on. It was a wonderful, sweet film. I mean, uh, Explorers was a great Explorers, River Phoenix, Nathan Hawk as kids. And, and this other kid as well with them, and they end up going into space from a self-made spaceship. You know, and it's, it's, it's almost a sci-fi movie from a kid's point of view, but it's not a sappy one. It's a, a kid, the way kids are weird and odd and get strange obsessions. That's Joe Dante. He really remembers all the weirdness about people. And he puts into genre narratives. But... It's the weirdness of people that's the actual thing that he's really good at. But he's also good at parody and things like that. So, Joe Dante's great. He's another favourite of mine. Okay, uh, next is George Romero. George Romero, uh, well known for zombie films, obviously. With The Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead. What's the other three? Um, Diary of the Dead, Survival of the Dead, Land of the Dead. He's done a lot of dead movies. Uh, and now he's dead. But he also did some great films like uh, Martin. Martin's brilliant. Martin's really good. Monkey Shines is terrific. I did a video on that a few weeks ago. Um, Dark Half is recommended. Dark Half's a very flawed film, but it's really interesting about a writer who kills off his pseudonym, which he uses to write these like trashy horror, horror thrillers. And the pseudonym comes to life and starts to hunt him down. <laughs> and it could have been terrible. It's based on a Stephen King novel, which is also cool. But it actually takes into the idea of a Jekyll and Hyde thing where the other character is a part of you, it's the part of you you're repressing and it's coming for you. Uh, so Romero is great, I mean, uh, I, I think the problem is I just did a video on him, so I'm not going to say much about him just now because I'm like, kind of exhausted by Romero things that's up at the moment. I'm sure I'll come back and do some more, but um, Romero's great. I want to put him on the list, but I just did a video on him, it's like, it's hard to see much more because I've already just talked about him. Right, um, okay, next is uh, James Whale. James Whale is the crazy English director who went to Hollywood and made Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, Invisible Man, Showboat. But basically, he's well known for his horror movies. He, he seemed to find horror movies to be his thing. I mean, he made The Old Dark House, which is a weird parody of a genre which didn't even exist, which was The Old Dark House kind of movie. It was setting the movie up. And it was parodying something that wasn't even established yet. Which is very hard to do. Uh, and Brain of Frankenstein's parodying the early horror movies, which weren't quite established yet. So he was, again, he was parodying something that wasn't quite... that was just starting up. Which made him a bit weird. His commercial, though, when, of, when Frankenstein was a massive hit, Brain of Frankenstein was less of a hit, but still a hit. It still spawned a lot of sequels. But it was viewed as a bit weird compared to the first one. Uh, Invisible Man was a big hit. It was a terrific movie about uh, the Claude Rains going mad when he's turned invisible, and it's like it's a really funny comedy, <laughs> as well as a thriller. I mean, we all made films that worked as an example of the genre, but also setting them up. But the thing about Whale was, I mean, the obvious thing he was gay, a gay man in Hollywood in the thirties, and it gave him an outsider perspective. So he really cared about the monsters and the weird doors. So he'd, he'd sympathy for all the characters, like the crazy mad scientist, like Frankenstein or the Invisible Man guy, all the monsters that's created like the Frankenstein monster. He was sympathetic to all of them, but he saw their flaws as well, so he, he was good at pointing out their absurdities as well as showing the pathos of the situation. He was great with images, all this gothic imagery. that wasn't quite gothic either, but he took what was gothic and added this weird, you know, parody of religion, you know, it, like a lot of his images seemed to be based on classic paintings. It was, 
It was taking the gothic genre as a base for the narrative, but it wasn't quite gothic in the style. It took certain things like the old dark house or a castle, and it created stuff like windmills. No, it didn't create windmills, but it created the idea of using windmills as a genre conceit. But a lot of the imagery of like fancy monster going getting chased through the mountains and things, it didn't quite feel gothic. It felt something else. It felt like a fairy story, another worldly story that's. But influenced by gothic. So he's not quite gothic, he's something else. He's this absurdist director who's got lots of influences and he puts influences on the screen. He's not shy about them. And they're these very sincere melodramas, which makes his stuff wonderful and it's great to rewatch. But you know, I'd definitely say Bride of Frankenstein and Old Dark House, the two to see first. Like they're the two really good ones. They're hilarious and they're funny and they're moving. They're just wonderful. Um, so try and see them first, but try and see any whale because whale's great. Okay, next Don Siegel. Don Siegel is the director of Dirty Harry, Invasion of the Body Snatcher, Charlie Varick, Escape from Alcatraz. He did a lot of Atlantic Eastwood films in the late 60s, early 70s. And he was one of the directors that Eastwood kept working with, even when he became a director. So when Eastwood became a director, he stopped working with a lot of other directors, he directed most of them himself. But Sieg was one of the ones he, he, he still worked with after that. I mean, most of our directors he would work with after that were like directors he could boss around, but Siegel was something else. Siegel was worked out of like, um, like zero budgets to start with. I mean, Invasion of the Boy Snatchers was meant to be a zero budget film no one cared about. It was just like, I think it was made in like 19 days or something. It was shot very fast and black and white and no one cared. It was just, it's a, it's a programmer. And he made lots of programmers and he was good at them. And he learned how to be very precise with imagery because he had to, he didn't have a budget, so he had to see this shot leads to this shot leads to this shot. So his films became very spare and very clear. So A to B to C was very clear. But then he gave the actors room to actually do interesting things within that. Um, so he was always very good with actors. I mean, if you look at like Walter Matthau and Charlie Varick, it's a very eccentric, but also a very mean performance. <laughs> it's like Matthau is allowed, is allowed to be Matthau, which is a very weird, interesting guy, but he's also a colder character who thinks ahead and can be brutal at times. And um, Invasion of Body Snatchers, the lead character is the straight guy, but he starts to go slowly mad as things go wrong. I mean, Clint Eastwood always seemed to play this guy who was stoic for Seagull, but who had weird depths to him. Like, it wasn't the Clint Eastwood of the Sergio Leone films. It was, the, these were the films that took her the kind of icon and then started to show the little cracks under the surface. Like, Dirty Harry had a wife and he's obviously a lonely guy who can't respond to the real world anymore. And he's just cracking up. Which we were lost in the sequel. The sequel's never quite got that kind of pathos to the character. Even though it was never really the real world, it was a fantasy world, but it was representing the world and the idea of a guy who can't quite um, connect. But it was also a great kind of cop movie with bizarre, just bizarre religious action sequences. But it was kind of funny because um, you needed some weird John Milius dialogue as well that came out, and um, there was lots of. Seagull was good with collaborators, they seemed to take who was there and actually get the best from them. So he kept on working with certain direct, he worked with certain actors again, like he worked with Jeremy Vernon quite a few times, but it was Eastwood. Like he seemed to like, like uh, good, he seemed to have good uh, space for actresses too, he didn't really, even though he made these direct, these fun with macho characters, the characters themselves were more fragile than expected and he was good with women who complimented the characters. So, he was taking a genre that was very kind of cliched and he was adding a human touch to it and made it, giving it human complications. So Seiko was really fascinating. He was like, because he still had the instincts of a really good B-movie director who understood narrative as a king. You had to get from A to B to C and pay things off, set things up, pay things off and keep the audience interested. But he had moments to let, like, in Charlie Varick, Joe John Baker plays a guy hunting Charlie Varick. He could have been a very bland character, but 
they made him like this mean weird guy and they gave him time to set himself up as a weird antagonist and Tommy Harry the the killer Andy Robson plays is another it could have just been a bland character but Siegel gave him the time to actually create a character that was strange and fascinating so Siegel was really good with actors as well as getting to the points and this film's a wonderful spear in the setup of the camera so he's not wasting shots he's not I think you can tell a lot of directors are very flabby in how they shoot stuff and you're wondering why you're getting disengaged from the film a lot of the time you're wondering why am I not engaged here well the stories are quite good and a lot of the time it's the director because they're putting too many shots in and they're not letting it's very like unconsciously you can tell when there's something, there's something that's been overdone and you're not getting a simple human connection. Seagull was very good at keeping it clear, keeping clear shots, allowing the actor to move within the shots so you're getting the story and you're filming stuff yourself. And you're not getting that sense of like you're getting a lot, like, too much directorial overshooting and you know that sense of the director not knowing what they wanted so they shoot a lot of food to give it to the editor and hope for the best. With Seagull you always know what you're shooting. There seem to be a lot of great directors know they're shooting and they'll be very careful what they're creating. So Seagull was really good. So uh, I definitely recommend trying to see as many of his films as possible. Uh, he's great. Okay next is another director from that year is John Frankenheimer. Frankenheimer had a great 60s. I mean uh, that's the one great thing about Harry Gnaiber, undisputed the 60s, late 50s, early 60s were great. After that, he came and went, but he's one of those directors I always had time for, even when he was not having the greatest period of his directorial career, because there was always a professionalism to his films that made it really fun to watch. But the 60s are where the, where the best stuff is. I mean, 60s are like the time when he was making like Manchurian Candidate Seconds, um, Budman and Mark Traz. He made uh, The Train with Buck Lancaster. He, he was doing a lot of really strong work. And he was like, he was getting an award for his work. He was getting a lot of praise because these were distinct films. The Seven Days of May was another one. They, a lot of them are black and white. A lot of them were this paranoid feel. Like I talked to the sisters um said so about how it was almost felt like the Palmer's parody in Frankenheimer by these weird paranoid shots, these wide angle shots, because Frankenheimer did a lot of them. Frankenheimer really liked like weird distorted shots. I mean second is full of that, second is this is almost like a nightmare logic. And uh like Van Chewing kind of is that as well, but it feels a bit more grounded. It has, it doesn't go full on with the paranoid. Maybe it seconds does, second just goes full on to the paranoia. That's what makes it great because it takes things seriously, but it's the, the melodramatic situations. After that, I mean, after the 60s, uh, apparently the drinking problem. But he still made some good stuff. Like the 70s, uh, there, there was like duds, like The Prophecy, which was a horror movie, which apparently, I've never seen it, but apparently it's a real turkey. Apparently it looks, it's really absurd. But it made stuff like French Connection too, which obviously didn't want to make a sequel, but he needed the money I think but it was a really good sequel I mean, it's, it's way more interesting than the freaking original but it's not as compulsive <laughs> as the freaking original it's good, it's better character stuff but it's not as visually interesting because you can see there's lots of sets and it, they cut between sets and um, uh, Doyle in France and it's it's a bit of a mismatch at times but it's still, it's still wonderful um, so Friedkin's, no, sorry, Frankenheimer had a bad, had a bad period. I mean, he made Black Sunday was another one where, where it was really well directed. There was a great atmosphere to it. There was wonderful stuff going on, but it was it, it was a bit flabby. Really, it could have done with losing on twenty minutes. That, that's the thing with seventies Frankenheimer. He seemed to make films that were a little bit too long, and no one told him to cut them down. <laughs> In the eighties, there's a, a security went further down. Uh, he made a really good one called 52 Pickup with Roy Strider. Uh, but it, the careers just started to fall away. In the 90s, they hit an idea of um, Island of Dr. Moreau. 
Breaking Bad with Ronan before he died. But it was a director that had his peak early and then he fell away. So I mean, if you want to see Frankenheimer, see the 60s stuff, 50s and 60s stuff. Then uh, some of the 70s stuff is really good. There's a lot of the 80s thing is good as well. And a lot, he did a lot of television work as well with Gary Sinise, which is apparently really good. So he's a really good director. He just it's kind of what happens to a director when they they've had their peak and they keep working, but the passion is not quite as there. But it's still the professionalism is there. So you get some good work, but you get a lot of stuff they're not really passionate about. So. He's still wonderful, I still really adore a lot of his films, but he's a very flawed director. He's kind of like Tim Burton that way, where there was a peak period and there's a period after that where you're going to get to some bad stuff and you just have to take your chances. <laughs> right, um, okay. Next is William Friedkin. Friedkin, well, since I talked about Frankenheimer, Friedkin did the original French Connection. He did, uh, he's another director who was big in the 70s and he fell away. But, like, uh, Frankenheim, there's a lot of interesting stuff after the peak as well. I mean, peak was Exorcist and French Connection, commercially, at least. Now, I'd say that he's made more interesting films than both of those, but I really like French Connection. French Connection is uh, about these two thuggish cops who are against this French guy who is trying to smuggle heroin into America. And they're trying to figure out how he's doing it. And it's like, there's not that much character work in it, it's just a compulsion of these guys chasing him and you can feel the compulsion of Dean Hackman and his Popeye Doyle, this compulsion you're going to get this guy and he doesn't get him, <laughs> which is funny, the guy gets away and it's just brilliant, it's really good, it's a really brilliant film but it's brilliant in filmmaking and it's not so great as we I mean, actually look into the details of what it's about, it's not really about anything, it's just a the director doing a great job on something that's okay as a material. Exorcist is the same way. Freaking did a really good job of a of a story which wasn't that great. It's just the way he did it that made it really work. Uh, after that, I mean, he made Saucer, which was a remake of Wages of Fear, which is wonderful. It's a beautiful film. It was a massive bomb. It just came out after Star Wars to get killed. I think I just killed his confidence. Like commercially, after that, he was never the same. He was just like I had a misdirector then. And he would do some weird films like Deal of the Century with Chevy Chase that was like, notoriously bad. And he did The Brinks Job, which was another big budget failure. Like he became a director who well, couldn't be relied on to deliver the goods with a big budget. But he made some interesting films like To Live and Die in LA, which was a bit, um, which was a, it's a cop film, a cop film, like French Connection, but it was a cop film, but, but the, Treasury Department trying to get counterfeiters, but it's done in a very weird style. And it's not really about the crimes, it's more about the mentality of the characters, the cops and the criminal, of the selfishness of the cops and the brutality of the cops and the, how the, what, the, what the criminal's actually about. So it's wonderfully done, it's a, one, it's a weird little film. Um, we did Rampage, which is another really interesting film, which is about uh, the death penalty, which he ended up recutting, just changed the point of view of the story. So, you can never get hold of that one because it was a De, La De Laurentiis film before De Laurentiis company crashed. And it's very hard to hold off Rampage, which is a shame because it's a really good film. After that, he kind of made a couple of other ones I like, like The Hunted, which Tommy Lee Jones and Nisho Del Toro, which is a, basically a manhunt movie, but it's done with very much dialogue and it's very spare and it's a very quiet movie and it wasn't what people expected, so it got bad reviews, but I really like that one, it's a really good movie. He made a couple of really trashy movies, like I mean Jade, which was David Caruso would have started it. It's trashy as hell, I love it, it's, it's trashy, it's, it's indefensible. He <laughs> <coughs> one of those movies, indefensible, but I kind of love it. He also made the Al Pacino uh, cruising movie, which was terrible, it's, it's bad. It's really bad, it's, it is indefensibly bad. It's not interesting at all, it's just a director going crazy. Right, um, next is um, Dario Argento. Argento is, um, you know, uh, the... I've done two, I did two of his movies, it's one of those ones where... So I've, just done, I've just done stuff with him, so I probably won't say much about him. But he's just great, it's done wonderful films in the... 60s, 70s and 80s and then he fell away. <laughs> He's like, basically after trauma, 
you can do not going to get much from them. <laughs> Even trauma's kind of flawed, but it's kind of interesting. But there's stuff like Bud's Crystal Plumage, Cat Nine Tails, Four Flies and Green Velvet, Deep Red, the Spear Inferno, Tenebrae, Opera, Two Evil Eyes, and Trauma. They're all worth watching. They're all great. They're wonderfully eccentric and weird and Argento likes to be eccentric. Argento's kind of a, a just this bizarre guy who makes these weird films and it's wonderful to watch. Um, I got a kick at his films. They're great. They're wonderfully odd films so but you have to see them because they're not, they're, there's plots to them, but they're not really about the plot, they're about the atmosphere, the, the, the weird characters who, the killer was always interesting, but they're always, almost like a gentle's favourite character, he really loves his killers, and the psychology is not um, textbook psychology, it's always weird science, and it doesn't really add up, if you looked at it from a logical perspective, but it adds up emotionally, and it's a, it's a bit of weird psychology of the characters, even if, how they explain the psychology doesn't add up. You feel the psychology and you feel what's wrong with them. That's what's great about it in the way the situation sets up where the hero and the villain are always linked in some weird way. It's always done in a really fascinating way. But again, I'm not going to say much because I've done two or gentle and I'll probably do more. So I don't want to over explain what I'm going to probably do next year at some point. Okay, um, the other one's Mario Bava which is uh, Argento's influence. He was an uh, ex-cinematographer from the 50s and Italian. Got into directing in 1960 with Black Sunday. Did one or two other smaller ones before we co-directed. And then he had a, a run for like 15, 20 years in Italy. Basically exploitation. Low budgets, he always worked well with low budgets. Never had enough money because he was a cinematographer. He knew how to use his budgets well, he knew how to use a lot of editing tricks, a lot of cinematography tricks to suggest things. So he had a massive run of like Black Sunday, uh, Black Sabbath, Kill Baby Kill, you know, um, Twisted Nerve, which was an inspiration for Friday the 13th. There was Lisa and the Devil, which is one of the weirdest films ever made, Tell Us the Valse by Lollipop. It's a Dream Logic film that was re cut into House of Exorcism, which is another. It was a rip which basically they put the exorcism into the film after the exorcist came out. And that's very strange, I mean, um, the film was incomprehensible to start with, but that made it even more incomprehensible. But it's definitely worth watching, I will put a release out, it's definitely worth buying. <laughs> um, it, yeah. You know, there's, there's a ton of his films, I'm trying to think of some of the titles, I'm trying to look down and see some more, because there's... Oh, there's Blood and Black Lace, yeah there's tons of them. You see, he made so many that it's kind of hard to remember all the titles. The titles are all kind of weird and it's like, you know, Italian horror movie titles are weird, but they're hard to remember them always. Like, what was that one again? And then you hear, you hear it, it's like, oh, that's a really good title. But there's so many of them, it's like, uh, they use up all their good titles about two years and then there's no, no good titles left after that. They're just. But Mario Bava is definitely worth seeing. He's, films are terrific. The acting's. Mm, kind of dodging a lot of them. So I don't go for acting, just go for atmosphere. Because the atmosphere is great and they're just definitely worth seeing. There's just something wonderful about them. Um, just it's a great atmosphere. Um, John McTiernan's next. He worked for Die Hard and uh, Predator and Hunt for October. He fell away in the, late, in the early noughties and any legal troubles and he's not hasn't made a film since, which is a shame because at his peak he was really good. I mean, uh, those three films I mentioned are all just great films to watch. I mean, uh, he, Last Action Hero is a interesting disaster. I mean, it was a disaster, but it was very interesting. It's uh, Schwarzenegger as a, as a character in a film, from the film Silver Willie, he's a, he's a character in it. It's, it doesn't quite work, but it's really interesting at the same time. I saw it in the cinema and it was really bizarre. It's very self-indulgent. What we were talking about earlier, the director shot too much and very self-indulgent, way too long. But it's still very interesting. So it's like, it was a kind of film that set me turning back a lot because it was such a disaster. But Die Hard 3, even Die Hard 3, which I'm going to talk about soon, it's terrific as well. It's only a good sequel in that series. Um, 13th Warrior, which I've been a video about before, it's terrific. 
very underrated. Thomas Crane Affairs, under underrated. It's had a remake that's actually better than the original. Uh, it's one of the few Pierce Brosnan films that are any good. And, <laughs> you know, any kind of fell away after that. I mean, that's after, after that he did Rollerball remake, which was a disaster. And he did Basic, which was pretty bland. So, I mean, it's... He's... He kind of fell away and he, he got a couple of duff scripts and did any legal problems. So that was it. Which is a real shame because he, his career had ups and downs, but it, it been told what the legal problems, the, the, the ups and downs were never that insane. Like, like whenever he did a disaster, he'd always have a comeback with something else. So it was never a major problem. He always managed to come back with something. And, you know, assuming if there were legal problems, he would come back with something else that worked. Because he'd really good, he's a really good craftsmanship. You watch the films; they're very well crafted. Even the films that don't quite work, they're so well crafted that. Um, but there's just a wonderful build to them all and the shots are have been thought through and he's good with actors I mean generally he's very good with actors and he gives them the space to actually do weird things like the 13th Warrior there's lots of Vikings that you shouldn't be able to tell apart but you have to get to know who everyone is during the set up so that when you get into the action you know who's getting killed and who isn't and even though they don't have that much dialogue, he does a lot of stuff with non-verbal. Same with Predator. In Die Hard, there's lots of non-verbal stuff where a lot of the terrorists you get to know just by their little mannerisms, even though they don't really say anything. So he's really good with supporting characters, he's very good with villains, creating interesting villains. I mean, Hans Gruber and Die Hard, the Predator, you know. And uh, 13th Warrior has like this really creepy, uh, weird... Um, villain that's based on the Beowulf idea but she's it's almost like she's come uh, from prehistory and then two or three years later Lord of the Rings come out and it's like this is 13th Warrior this is, seems really influenced by 13th Warrior I don't know what it was but it felt I mean, it could have been influenced by the same books but it felt like an extension of 13th Warrior and we've Game of Thrones now which feels like it's built in the same world as 13th Warrior so I'm a big fan of 13th Warrior. I'm hyping it to hell so people watch it. Right, um, so McTiernan's great, we'll see McTiernan. Um, now we're with two British directors. Um, Terence Fisher is the first one. Uh, Hammer. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do a lot on Hammer, so I'm doing Hammer next year. If you don't like Hammer, I'm not going to do it all the time, but there's going to be some Hammer stuff next year. <laughs> so yeah, we'll get a lot of Terence Fisher. Um, Horror Dracula, Curse of Frankenstein, The Brides of Dracula, he did, did most of the Frankenstein movies, he did Phantom of the Opera, Curse of the Werewolf, did a lot of really cool Hammer stuff. Um, he created a, a mood, that created a whole distinctive tone for Hammer that other directors could ape and then work against and to create something that was very unique and interesting. They all came from Fisher, Terence Fisher is brilliant. He's a massive influence in British film in a way that isn't really acknowledged which is why I'm going to do some videos next year about it. I don't want to mention him here because he deserves his list but because I'm not going to do some more on him I'm not going to say much but his stuff's wonderful. It really is. It's really well directed. It's got a really weird tone to it that's distinctly made by a guy who's knows what he's doing but he's very eccentric in his style. He's going to do his thing that's it. So, he's wonderful, but um, so we don't like Hammer movies, he's sorry, in advance. But I love them, so I try and do a mix of things in this channel, like I'm trying to mix up like the like breast on stuff also with some eccentric stuff like the Asian things and Hammer. So, so you're never getting the same thing again and again. Uh, finally it's Alex Cox, Alex Cox is one of those directors who I've always loved his films and He's pretty much had to be hand to mouth for like 20 odd years. But it doesn't matter because he keeps on making good films, so it doesn't really matter. I mean, he started big with Repo Man, Sid and Nancy. They were two massive hits, so everyone thought it was the next big thing. Then he made Straight to Hell, which is an eccentric gay western parody. Then Walker, which was a film for Universal about an American imperialist in Nicaragua and how the Americans were all scumbags. Then he ended up cut footage from the modern Nicaraguan war into uh, historical film 
I love Walker. Walker's terrific. It's really weird. Uh, and it's really hated. But definitely try and see because it's a one of a kind. And then he made his, his best films after that. Like, you'd think that would be a peak of career and it would go downhill, but no, this is when he gets really good. He made Death in the Compass with Professor Reckleson, based on a Borgers novel, which is a... And you start Peter Boyle as well. It's, it's really stylized and weird, but I definitely recommend it. You, you, you can't get it in DVD just now. I don't think you can get it in Blu ray yet. But it's wonderfully stylized and it's got a weird. And the acting's slightly over the top, but it's, it seems to work for this film. It's got a weird tone to it that's really wonderful. I just loved that one. Death Comes is wonderful. Highway Patrolman, which is one of the best films of the 90s, it's brilliant. It's about a highway patrolman in Mexico and all the corruption in Mexico. It's one of the best movies of the 90s and it's barely mentioned. And that's a crime. It should be, have special editions, Blu-rays, it should have the works. It's completely ignored. That's a total crime. Um, Three Businessmen is wonderful. I don't want to say much about that one because you have to watch it. Um, without knowing much about it, which I did. You need to kind of, you think, I just don't want to say anything about it, you just watch it, it's amazing. You can probably get it for almost nothing online now. It's an amazing film. Um, Revenge's Tragedy, another one with Sin, which is really cool, it's a really bizarre adaptation of the classic, um, tale, classic play. Very cynical, very bitter, it, it, it takes, it's a modernisation version. It's just really good. It's um, but as eccentric though. So Cox got very eccentric in the the noughties. and he did Repo Check was another one that's a lot of people hate it. I really like it, but it's willfully eccentric at that point. He went willfully eccentric in the noughties, but I still really like his films. So he's wonderful. Um, so that's my list. I mean, there's two I would mention, I'm not going to say much about it, it's Ben Wheatley and Bernard Rose are both really interesting directors. I don't much time to go into them just now, but, I'll, but I'm going to do some stuff in the films at some point next year. But, um, but I wanted to include them on the list, even though I'm not going to see anything. But tr maybe try and see uh, Bernard Rose's Frankenstein film, it's really good. And Ben Wheatley, try and see uh, A Field in England, it's also very good and very weird. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, that's me for now. Uh, I've got some more videos this week. I'm leading up to Christmas now, so it'll, the schedule will get, might get a bit weird. I'm not sure yet. I'm trying to keep up a schedule, but with Christmas, you can never quite tell how it's going to happen. I, I think when it comes up to Christmas week, I'll, I'll pack them in a bit more, because I know like from Christmas till after New Year, I'm going to stop. So I'm trying to pack in some stuff before that. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you soon.